The world's very own Glenda Jackson was truly one of a kind, a double Oscar winner who didn't turn up to collect her trophies, who turned her back on stage and screen for the drama of politics, and was frequently described as formidable and ferocious, but won over the nation by fooling around with a couple of comedians. Time for me to act! That'll be the day! As a girl, she never considered acting as a career, but went on to become one of the world's and the nation's favourite. She's told the story many times, but here she tells Terry Wogan how she started her career in West Kirby. Well, my very first job when I left school was at Boots Cash Chemists in West Kirby, yes. How could... how do you get away from that? Did you always know you were going to be an actress? Did you feel the urge inside? No, the strongest uh, feeling inside was boredom unrelieved boredom and a friend of mine was with an amateur dramatic group and said come along it will be fun and off I trotted and I did quite enjoy it and so I wrote to the only drama school I'd ever heard of which was the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art and I had to do two auditions I remember because I had to have a scholarship because we couldn't afford to pay for me to go Mm. and suddenly I found myself there training to be an actress. Did you at any time think you were going to fail? Um, Well, I was told when I left by the then principal, John Fernald, not to expect to work much before I was 40 because I was essentially a character actress. And that, in fact, was true, really, because when I left drama school and entered the theatre, the the kind of parts for people of my age, you had to be essentially... You were either blonde and pretty or dark and weird, and I didn't really fit into either category, (laughs) markedly fit into either category. So what happened? Well, John Osborne wrote a play called Look Back in Anger and the whole face of British theatre changed. Things became more earthy. Well, I don't really like using the word real because it isn't realistic in a true sense, but certainly people were allowed to speak in voices other than fluting uh, middle-class Oxbridge or rural country kind of voices, and uh, suddenly the north of England was discovered, so people like me had a chance. What is the accent that comes most easily to you? Well, I suppose it's Cheshire, which I lapse back into when I go home for about five minutes, and it has to be one of the plainest sounds <laughs> in the whole dialectic, not dialectic, dialect calendar. It's very flat. But going to Rada, don't they tend to be theatrical and change the voice and get the rounded vowel? They did, it? certainly in my day, slightly. They, it, that too was changing. I was very lucky, actually. A lot of things were changing at the time. I, apparently, my voice teacher found the greatest difficulty with me was that I was so loud. I remember her saying to me, you must come from a very large family because you have such a loud voice. <laughs> <laughs> That's not really a compliment, is it? I mean, it's... Well, it's quite useful in big theatres, I hasten to add. I mean, that you can be heard is quite valuable. Her voice wasn't too loud for Glenda to start picking up the type of challenging roles that almost became her calling card. But let's get out of the way. The fact that Glenda wasn't perfect. Yes, there was something that even she struggled with. Cry on cue. Um, And the trick is, for me, is that I stare at a light for as long as I possibly can, and then when you blink, the tears are there. Another trick is they break an ammonia file under your nose. Isn't it awful? I'm taking all the <laughs> away. Um, some people can cry just like that. I mean, yes. it's, it's just, a, it's just a, a trick. Another thing people can never do is to sneeze. I mean, to do, I mean you have mm. to act a sneeze or use a stuff. Yes. I can't burp. I can't. I had to burp for something, and they had to put it in the soundtrack afterwards. I could no more do it than fly. Luckily, that inability didn't hold Glenda back, and an early stage role that gained her attention came in the play Marisade. She played a woman in a lunatic asylum who had been herself cast in a play being staged by the inmates. A multi-layered, complicated piece, it was an early sign of Glenda's love for a challenge. What? Are all these faces soon? These faces will close around me. These eyes and mouths will call to me to join them! There were three levels, really, that you were working on. I mean, you were working on the sort of basic level of an actress tackling any part. And then you had to be a believable inmate of an asylum at that particular time, which is very different to being in a lunatic asylum now. And then on top of that, you had to be that girl playing that part. And... The greatest difficulty I found with that play was because of these different layers and levels you had to be working on all the time. There was very little interrelation with the other actors, which is usually the thing that sort of bolsters you up throughout a long evening and a hard play, which that was. If Marisard put Glenda on the map, it was 1969's Woman in Love that would transform her life completely. 
Glenda once said, acting isn't about dressing up, but it's about stripping bare. She didn't mean literally, but Woman in Love did become one of the, one of the most talked about films of the decade, thanks partly to its nude scenes. It saw Glenda co-starring alongside Oliver Reed, Alan Bates and Jenny Lydon, and would be the first of three films she would make with director Ken Russell. It has a, a kind of Svengali-like reputation. Uh, yes. Were you aware of having a performance coaxed out of you? Well, I don't know where it comes from, this Svengali bit. I mean, I think he, he's... He's the greatest founder of that particular myth for reasons best known to himself. I mean, the marvellous thing about Ken is that he leaves the actors totally alone. I mean, he ignores you. I mean, the, the largest note that I've ever had off Ken was, I think, probably on Women in Love. And he said, um, yes, he said, it's very nice, but um, it needs to be a bit more, you know. And, <laughs> and you do. I mean, this is, the, this is the mysterious thing about Ken, is that he creates such a climate of interest for the actors, and he is so open to suggestions from everybody. I mean, from sort of clapper boy on up. He will listen if people have an idea. That you find yourself having ideas. Oh, you are so beautiful. And I must go. No. Let me go alone. How would you characterise Ken Russell's style of directing? <laughs> I don't know that I've got the words. I don't think anyone has got <laughs> the words. He could be absolutely ghastly. He could be rude, not to the actors. I give him credit here. And, you know, he could scream his head off and be furious, and then 30 seconds later he'd be completely stuck on a rock somewhere, and anybody who had an idea, he would listen to, and listen to openly and properly. And not infrequently, they would, that, those ideas would trigger something in him, and he would do it. But he was a marvellous, marvellous director to work with, because he had images, visions, ideas, because it was always with him much more something that was seen than was said. It was the image, it was the vision, it was the idea. Yes, there are images which live long in the imagination Absolutely. when you think of Ken Russell Absolutely. films. Yeah. You made Women in Love in 1969. I mean, that was a film which, I mean, I remember there's a scene when you were confronted, your character, Gudrun, confronted by a herd of yeah, cattle. Yeah, I had to s dance through this herd of cattle. With horns. Oh, yeah, and those horns that turn upwards, I was petrified. And the man who's heard it was said, oh, don't worry, they won't attack you. And I thought, oh, really? Aren't they charming, Ursula? Charming? Won't they do anything to us? Oh, I'm sure they won't. I'm frightened. Keep singing. It was just amazing. I mean, dancing with these creatures <laughs> and expecting to be gored, but it worked. Oliver Reed would later compare acting with Glenda to being run over by a Bedford truck. And she was always formidable when it came to expressing herself. Woman in Love, of course, an adaptation of the famous novel by D.H. Lawrence. And here we find Glenda discussing it with a degree of frankness and honesty that she would become known for. Had you read the book at the time? Well, I'd read it many years before when I'd gone through the sort of obligatory D.H. Lawrence phase where you read everything he's ever written. And I went back and read it again when I knew I was playing it and wondered why I'd ever liked D.H. Lawrence in my life. Why? And, well, I thought it was so full of that... I mean, it seemed to me 
so much fuller of his basic lie, I think, about the man-woman relationship. And know? what is that lie? Well, you know, that a, a women have to eat and destroy men before they can really be women, and, and men's job in life is to fight off this savage attack. And I think that's all so ridiculous, really. And I found that book so full of that particular philosophy and so full of enormous longers when he expounded it for chapter after chapter. But then, if you skip all those bits and get to the characters of, of the people, I found it fascinating. And, um, you know, I used to clutch my penguin copy to my bosom because he writes at such length about their internal situation and then gives them possibly four words to say, you know, that you, you had to know what was going on underneath. He also gave some pretty good descriptions of you, like the following from the book. Goodwin shook her head in a queer, half-doubtful, half-sardonic motion. She had steady, large, hostile eyes. There was a body of cold power in her, her eyes dark and staring, her face impassive, almost sulky, so that she seemed to be backing away in antagonism even while she was advancing. Now, that wouldn't be a bad description of some of the things I've seen you do on stage and screen. Well, I'm sure. I mean... <laughs> I don't quite know what to say to that. Yes, I mean, uh, certainly the sulkiness I know I have very strongly in me. And that sort of um, sense of disliking before I like, yes, that is... is and also uh, looking people straight in the eye, as you're doing to me now. Well, yes, but not for very long. I suddenly start shifting off. She may have found the novel to be flawed, but Glenda's focus on character worked. Her performance won her her first Oscar, which had to be presented to her here, because she was too busy working to fly to America for the ceremony. Oh, he's got my name on it. Yes. Uh, was it a complete surprise? Totally, yes, totally. No hint at all? No, they really do manage to keep it secret. And uh, it really is, you know, anybody's guess who will actually get it. And this friend of mine was watching the award ceremony on television in New York and picked up a phone and told me I'd won, which was very nice of them. What time was that? Half past six. Half past six. Which is quite late for me, because I'm usually up at six with the baby, so <laughs> it was, you know, an extra half hour in bed. What are you actually working on now? Um, I'm working on this Mary Queen of Scots film, which Hal Wallace is producing. Vanessa Redgrave is playing Mary, and I'm playing Elizabeth again. And um, we start actually shooting it, I think, in May, so at this time I'm rushing around for costume fittings and wigs and things. I'm looking forward to it very much. I admire Vanessa Redgrave enormously, and it'll be very exciting to work with her, I think. Glenda's comment about playing Elizabeth again was referenced to another success she enjoyed the same year as her first Oscar win. <laughs> In the acclaimed BBC series Elizabeth R., Glenda played the Virgin Queen as she aged across six hour-long episodes. Her dedication was such that she shaved her head for the part, demonstrating to all it was the size of the role, not the size of the screen, that mattered. Do the people love me? Yes, Your Majesty. They have been good company. You're a very unstarry star, aren't you? Mm. I mean, you don't sort of... Uh, go to premieres or you don't seek the high life and you live quite a, an ordinary yes, way. Yes. Um, why is this? Well, it's partly because I don't, um, I don't like the starry sort of life. I mean, and it isn't a thing that I would be good at. And the other thing is I, th I, I, I think of myself as an actress. I'm not a personality as such. I, I've got nothing of my own that I can sell in that sense. And I think if you lose touch with actuality with with the way life is really lived by most people you lose the roots into acting really the more remote you get from people the more difficult it is to act i think and mm. you know most lives are not comprised of enormous tragedies or enormous joys but um they're comprised of tiny little pinpricks you know of having to queue at the butchers or it starts to rain when you're waiting for a bus and and these sort of things i think are very important to keep within your own frame of reference. It would be too easy to constantly be chauffeured from one place to another or, you know, ring up a large store and say, send me so much. And I think that's very dangerous for actors. Yes. Very but dangerous. what are the things that, 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 uh, that you don't have to do now that make you pleased that you, you have made it? Well, I don't have to uh, save all the dog ends from the ashtrays to roll my own, which <laughs> I've had to do. <laughs> I can... I can smoke as far as the fatal third and then stub it out without a qualm. <laughs> so that's quite nice. But that's the only thing, is it? 
Oh, no. I mean, obviously, there are larger things. I mean, I live in a house as opposed to a flat, and um, I don't have to constantly, you know, count the pennies. But in a, in a curious way, it isn't the financial uh, benefits that are the largest, because the biggest financial jump I ever made was when I joined the Royal Shakespeare Company, when I went from being a casually employed actress at £15 a week, if I was lucky, to a permanently employed actress at £25 a week. And that bigger jump I will never make again. I mean, it's impossible. You know, that was the biggest financial financial advancement of my life. Yeah. Um, but the greatest bonus is that, that now I can pick and choose what I want to do, really. Yeah. And that's the most important thing to yes, anybody. Yes, mm. yes, absolutely. And now, an example of Glenda picking and choosing what she wanted to do, and a choice that resulted in one of the most celebrated performances. Glenda's Cleopatra, the Morecambe and Wise version, has a nation in stitches and became one of Britain's television's most loved moments. My queen, terrible news from abroad. They want the Oscar back. They want it back. <laughs> Kiss me! All right, then. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever thought of being a plumber? What's it like working with these two? Wonderful. Of course it is. Really? <laughs> oh, but, but why? I mean, I mean, it's the truth. You can't win, can you? Oh, well, you're a fool if you try. <laughs> I mean, that isn't, of course you that isn't win. the, uh, course you the win. thing. You nearly so. dried on that scene when the head was talking. How dare you? I you, did not. You're not. trying to time the laugh. Do you mind? <laughs> Sorry, nothing yes. personal. You, you were, Sorry about that. You were chittering there, I see. Yeah. You're going to... <clears throat> yes, I was. I was chewing the inside of my mouth. The best piece of advice I've been given in all these years came from Eric. And he said to me, faster and louder. And that was it. And it was just marvellous. No. Oh, OK, yeah, fine, OK, I'll do that. Faster and louder. They were just marvellous to work with. Well, excuse me, <laughs> certainly so. It's just that... Shall I tell her? Yes, tell her, tell her. See, nowadays, we only work with title people now, don't we? Yes, title people. <laughs> On one occasion, he actually said to me, don't laugh. You know, even though he and Ernie would laugh, but they controlled their laughter during a scene. I mean, they were just so marvellous to work with. Because one of the really amazing things about them, they had this reputation for being, you know, intensely funny, and they were. But they were also intensely professional. And it was such, such a privilege to work with them. And to be and to be that close to watching them work as well. It was terrific. There would be more guest spots on the Morecambe and Wise show. But these didn't make audiences realise that this serious actor could be seriously good fun. But they'd also lead Glenda to a cast in her first romantic comedy. How did you get the part in A Touch of Class? Because you hadn't done... Because Melvin Frank, who wrote the script and directed the film eventually, saw the Morecambe and Wise show in which I appeared and um, had read some of that I'd said I'd like to do a comedy, which I would, and sent me the script. And I thought, oh, this is very funny. Yes, I'd like to do this. And that's how it was. So it really was Eric and Ern who got yes, it? Yes, it was Eric and Ern. <laughs> well, we'll have, to, we'll have to see a, a bit from that. Mm. Um, this, in fact, is uh, where you and George Siegel are in Spain. You've had a row and you've just come back to the hotel from the airport. Your second Oscar. Well, I wish I could think of something more interesting to say than very pleasant, but, I mean, that's how it feels, very pleasant. Um, I'd completely forgotten they were last night. It came as a total surprise. It never occurred to me that I'd actually get it. Oh, come on now, you Truly, couldn't have forgotten. no, I had forgotten that they were last night, um, and it wasn't until the phone rang at 6 o'clock this morning that um, I remembered. But well, what did you say then? Probably something unrepeatable on family television. And I, I think I was very amazed. <laughs> what did it mean to win an Academy Award, though? Well, at the time, it's like somebody giving you a great big present. And, you know, you don't know where to put it, really. Um, but over time, it's, you know, they become... Oh, I'm going to sound so iffy here. You can't use them to be better at what you're trying to do. Do you know what I mean? They, they're not... They're very nice to have. All awards are very nice to have. But they don't... They don't make you any better. 
They don't make you better as an actor, but a lot no. of actors would say that you can use them as leverage because the next time you get a movie, your fee goes up, you can get a better role, your status is enhanced. You wouldn't didn't know feel how that to at do all. That, no. Wouldn't know how to do that. Really? No. What did you do with the Oscars? I gave them to my mother. I gave most of my awards to my mother it was in those days. Yes, she was still alive. And we've I've got one which is upstairs in my son and daughter-in-law's flat. And one of my nephews asked if he could have one of them to take to a school thing. And I said, yeah, fine. And I've never got it back. But I mean, I know he's still got it. It hasn't <laughs> been lost, but it's somewhere. With another Best Actress Oscar, Glenda found herself in the company of Vivian Lee and Olivia de Havilland. At that point, the only other female British stars who have won the top prize twice, but dared to describe Glenda as a star, and you've done yourself a ticking off, as did unlikely interviewer David Soule would find here in 1982. You're a star of some magnitude, I mean, around the world. Anyway. I always object yeah. to that word. I know I'm you do, sorry. and that's why I said it. <laughs> oh, I see, you're being merely provocative now. No, no, no I but, don't like that word. I don't but is it sort of an entrapment, that. isn't it? I think so, yes. Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, it may be one form of an entrapment. I regard it as, as the ultimate of that particular fulfilment, in a way. I mean, I think you're a star if you can't be anything else. <laughs> um, I, I don't mean that to sound as pejorative as it does. I, in a way, it is the ultimate expression of an individual idea of oneself. That, to me, is what a star is. I mean, someone who has something so strongly defined within themselves, their own personality, their character, call it what you will, mm -hmm. that that is actually worth paying money to see. Now, I don't have that. I mean, I only have something paying, you know, worth paying money to see if somebody gives me the words and gives me the character and gives me the space to play it in. But a star is a star is a star wherever they are. And, and that is something that they have crafted, presumably, from within themselves. So they are their ultimate fulfilment, in a way. But I think it precludes mm. the possibility of other things. Precludes, yeah. I think, the possibility of acting, in a way. So, don't call her a star. In fact, don't refer to her as a great actress either, if at all possible. What separates you as a, as a great actress from the run-of-the-mill actress? What, is there any one quality that you think you have, that you were born with, that you acquired, or whatever, that separates you from other actresses? Well, I always judder when people say great actress like that. No offence, no offence. But um, I don't like it because I don't know how you ever define it. I mean, the thing that, that I've had is a great deal of luck. I mean, I was given opportunities at a time when I could exploit them, in a sense, when I was ready for them. I mean, I know people that I worked with in rep who are as good and, in some instances, better than me, who will never be given those opportunities and will never be able to show what they can do. And they, are, they just died out there in weekly rep. I mean, because there comes a point where you can't actually recreate anymore. I mean, the failure just gnaws at your soul and there's nothing left. And I've been very fortunate. I mean, I've worked with very good people in very good things and I've had chances to extend myself. But yeah. I don't think there's a recipe. I mean, I can't turn to you and say, the way I differ from any other actress you care to name is because I have this and she has that. I, I don't agree with that, you see, at all. I think so, the cream, no, I don't. I think the cream comes to the top. I don't think there's any system that is that is is that prohibitive that it prevents the very talented person coming through. It's I really not don't. true, you see. It's not true because the actual life. I mean, I can only speak about the theatre, which is which is the world I know. And I think, in a, in a curious way, the more sensitive you are, which allies very closely with being creative, the harder it is. Therefore, the punishment is greater. One of the things you have to be actually is resilient. I mean, that was one of the things they said to me at drama school, and it's true. You've got to be healthy, and you've got to be resilient. Because when you begin, you don't exist. I mean, you're not even treated as a human being. You're treated as less than a human being. And I think the more sensitive you are, in a sense, the more difficult that life is, and you get knocked down much more quickly. Mm. And, I, and I, I think in that sense I'm fortunate. I, I mean, I, I, uh, I'm not saying that I'm totally insensitive, but I do have an ability to bounce back. You, you said something earlier on about the people who were left behind in rep, that they mm. were, I think your phrase was, corroded by failure. Mm. Um, given the other extent, how much is, is uh, your kind of famous success, how much, is that, how much could that corrode you in, in a different sort of way? It could corrode you if you wanted it to. I mean, it would be very easy to believe what you read about yourself and always expect to be given preferential treatment if you wanted it, and that, of course, is terribly corrosive because that would separate you from people, and acting is about people, actually. 
Um, but if you can exercise a certain amount of restraint, and uh, coming as I do from a largish family who send me up rotten, if ever I try to put it on, um, that's never really been a problem. That encounter with Michael Parkinson also found Glenda discussing her 1971 film Sunday Bloody Sunday, which contains another of her Oscar-nominated performances. Despite believing it was important for an actor to maintain a normal life, the conversation highlighted the strange world she'd now been inhabiting for years, where appearing naked could be part of the job. How do you get an animal for a love scene? Or do you have to? Well, you don't. You don't? I mean, it's as simple as that, really. I mean, you're saying, being introduced, I remember when we were doing, what was it, Sunday Bloody Sunday, I met Tony Britton for the very first time in my life at uh, nine o'clock in the morning in bed, stark naked. I'd never met him before in my life. And uh, we said, how do you do? And they said, action. And that was it. <laughs> Just, and you, you, you get no... But, well, you see, the, the difficulty, the thing here is that I think one must, must, must make clear, acting is not behaving. I mean, this is the difference. I mean, there is behaviour, which is one thing, but that is not what acting is. And I, I would like to be able to define clearly and lucid for you, lucidly for you the difference, but I can't, but I know that it is different. For one thing, you have to be able to repeat that, that acting time after time after time. And um, behaviour... It changes, doesn't it? I mean, yeah. second by second and minute by minute. But acting, you, you, you have to, you know, repeat and repeat and repeat. But, I mean, could you play, for instance, could you play a, a love scene? Uh, I mean, Tony Britton, I, I assume that you rather liked him when you met him. He's um, quite an attractive man. This it wouldn't have made any difference if I'd hated him. Really? Mm. I mean, if I had found him physically repellent to the point that when they said cut, I'd heaved my guts up at the side of the camera. <laughs> you would have done I mean, I still two. would have done it. Well, that's what they pay you for. That's your job. Unity was a subject interviewers often turned to with Glenda, but Glenda, her answers were unlike any others. After all, who else would take a question involving the cinema's greatest sex symbols and end up with a response about varicose veins? You've been described as intellectuals Raquel Welsh. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that's a fair assessment? No, I think that's one of those night meets journalese statements, isn't it really? No, no. I think Raquel Welsh is a very bright lady, actually. <laughs> In fact, if you've also been inscribed as, as the first lady of the flesh. How mm. easy is it to take your clothes off for a film when it requires it? Well, I mean, at the time, it was very easy. It, it didn't cause me any worry at all, except it's always a very cold process. I mean, it always seems to take place first thing in the morning when the studio's freezing cold. And uh, I, I get cold easily, and so there'd be all that, you know, can you see the ghost bumps on her skin sort of routine. But no, it doesn't worry me. It didn't worry me at all. A playwright once said to me that if people could take their clothes off in a room together, there'd be no class consciousness. Do you think there's an element of truth I don't think that's in true at all, <laughs> no. I think, I think certain elements of the class structure are very evident when people take their clothes off, like all those varicose veins of all those poor ladies who had to stand for hours behind shop counters, you know, and you meet an equivalent lady from a different class and her legs are beautiful. It's not all inherited. I know it's basically there, but a lot of it ain't. Oh, no, I don't think that's true. I think the flesh can mark our class just as easily as the things we put on top of it. How easily is your class mark when you haven't got your clothes on? Well, I've got varicose veins for a start. Um, well, I, I suppose it's... it's. I mean, I've got all those peasant... I've got very large, very flat feet, and the toes are knobbly, because um, not my... I hasten to add, my mother never put me into shoes that didn't fit, but um, in my sort of late early teens rather, when I could occasionally buy my own shoes, I'd go for fashion and fashion had to be the cheapest end of the market and they're never very well made so my toes are all knotted and I've got very big hands and the skin on them is usually, it's not looking too bad at the moment, um, flaking <laughs> from uh, sticking it in water because I can't work in rubber gloves. <laughs> I mean I think rubber gloves are a sort of, a not a working class uh, kind of thing. Well they weren't in my day and things like that. That down-to-earth quality was a constant with Glenda. Even in the early days with her greatest successes, she would discuss the plans for something completely different once the fuss had died down and people just weren't accustomed to movie stars talking so openly. Miss Jackson, I understand that when you retire from the stage, you'd like to take up social work. Yes, I think I probably will. Mm. Which branch of the social services interest, interest you most? Well, I'm not absolutely clear in my own mind whether it will be something within the social services that I'll have to train for, be it a child care officer or something of that nature, or whether it will be that I will opt to work 
for one of the charitable organisations. I mean, I'll just have to see. I might not be fitted for a child care officer or something of that nature. I would like it to be work with children and what we call deprived families. Um, if I can't do whatever is required within the frame of the social services, then I'll probably work for something like War on Want or Shelter or Save the Children, something like that. You keep muttering about retiring. Yes, Is I wish really I'd true? never opened my mouth those many years ago and I was saying, well, I think you have to be logical about it. I mean, your face gets too old for a film camera and there's a terrible dearth in parts for women when you hit your late 40s, as I'm about to do any day now. And I really don't think that I can sit around waiting to play the older character ladies. So, and I certainly am not going to sit around at home polishing the furniture, so I will find something else mm. to do. Do you think it's perhaps almost a defence that actresses say, I mean, almost as an opt-out, if I don't get work, I can always say I retired. I mean, I can't imagine that you could possibly stop. Oh, I can. I can imagine it quite easily. Well, what would you do? Well, that's what I'm waiting to see. I don't know. I mean, I've, I've shot my mouth off about so many things that I would like to do, and there are a great many things I would like to do. I mean, I'd have to go back to school for quite a few of them, and I might be too old to learn now. I mean, your brain does start mm. to get what, what are some rickety. of the things? I mean, totally well, I'm very direction. interested in all... In, in it, it always sounds like, you know, Mrs. Do-Gooder, but there are a great many areas of what we blanketly call social work that I find particularly interesting, and that I think, you know, I might be quite useful in. But that would mean going away and actually doing a two-year course and things of that nature. And, and Are you involved uh, already when you can? Yes, but only in a totally amateur and sort of, you know, visiting fireman way, which isn't particularly useful. I mean, opening bazaars and coffee mornings and arranging evenings to raise money and things like that. But on the actual, you know, gritty day-to-day -day basis of actually trying to break people out of a terrible cycle of social depression, mm -hmm. I'm not into that. Do you enjoy acting? Is it, is it no, it's that's not. It's, it, no, I've never enjoyed it, and I, I, I've never understood really when people say they do enjoy it because it's not an enjoyable process. I don't think you don't ever have time to enjoy it for one thing, and the problems certainly on a stage vary from not only from performance to performance but from minute to minute with a live audience. So the amount of awareness that you have to have all the time I think excludes enjoyment. There's a sort of realisation of that something's happened once it's over. But I wouldn't think it was an enjoyable way of spending an evening there. And on Paul Merton's team, a woman who gave up a career in films to become a Labour MP, bidding the world of fantasy and make-believe a fond hello, Glenda Jackson. <laughs> It wasn't until 1991 that Glenda finally retired from acting, and in 92 she was elected into Parliament as a Labour MP representing Hampstead and Highgate. What do you think the expectancy was like uh, within the House when they knew that obviously you'd been elected and that you were now joining them in Parliament? Because after all, here was an extremely famous face that they'd been used to in a different context. I think the initial expectation was that I would fall flat on my face. I mean, there is a myth about those members of my previous profession, and certainly those women who were members of my previous profession, um, that there is nothing between our ears other than a blank space. So I was expected to be an idiot, I think. I was also expected, if I had anything to say at all, for it to be exclusively in the area of what is called the arts and cultural life of this country, and that I was going to expect preferential treatment uh, none of those things were part of my thinking in going to the House of Commons. And how did you feel when you delivered your maiden speech? Oh, I've never been so frightened in my life. I mean, I stood up and I shook and I, I have attempted to define why I found that so frightening. And I really haven't come up with an answer that satisfies me. The things that were running at the back of my mind when I was making my maiden speech was that some of the greatest exponents, the greatest practitioners of the English language had lived in my constituency. Keats kept floating into my mind. And uh, so I, I think it was quite right that I should shake, and I think it is quite right. You do see uh, ministers on both sides of the House, uh, both government and shadow ministers, when they're speaking at the dispatch box, a certain nervousness, fingers tremble and things of that nature. And that is as it should be. After all, um, the Chamber of the House of Commons is the centre of our democratic process, or it should be. And you should be giving always of your best when you're in that place. But do you think that uh, they expected more of you because, after all, you had been performing for millions for years? No, I think they expected less of me. And they also believe that um, acting is some kind of cheating. Um, the best acting always tries to tell the truth. And if there is a link there, then I think the best politics also is determined to discover and expose the truth. 
Did it irritate you when some people wrote and said, now here is Linda Jackson, probably the only MP where all her constituents have seen her with her clothes off? No, I mean, I can only remember one person um, writing about that. It, it, it has never been an issue. I mean, I do remember once I was in my office and, uh, uh, you know, my shirt had got rucked up on, under my skirt, so I quite naturally did what I do. I mean, I hiked my skirt up to pull my blouse down and my assistant said, oh, oh, the door's open. And I did say to her, you know, look, I mean, half the world has seen me with no clothes on at all. I'm not going to worry about somebody seeing my clean nick. Glenda remained a member of parliament for 23 years, eventually stepping down in 2015. A year later, after an absence of almost a quarter of a century, she returned to the stage. The play was King Lear, and having complained for years that Shakespeare had always written better for male characters, Glenda's solution was just to take the lead role. You were away from the stage and the screen for 23 years, yeah. and then you played Lear in the West End and on Broadway. When you were acting, performing for the first time in over two decades, was it like muscle memory? Was it just like getting on a bicycle again? Did it just all flow very easily? Forgive me, but you present acting as though it's in a box in your kitchen and you go and you open the cupboard and you take the box out and you do it. It isn't like that. You have to connect with the words. You have to connect with what is behind the words, what is prompting the words. And you have to listen to all the other words as well. And so it's a process of hearing and learning. It's not something that's there that you just put on. You know what I mean? How did you prepare for that role? Learnt the words. And, and physically, though, because that's well, hugely physically, demanding. Well, physically, I used to go swimming every day at my local swimming pool in Lewisham. It opened at 7 o'clock for the elderly or disabled, and I swam. And then, of course, the actual play itself gives you energy, which is amazing. I mean, it's just amazing what's buried in that play. I started from the basis that no one during his entire life had said no to him. No one had ever, ever said no. You know, he'd always been king of the world. You also made a BAFTA and Emmy-winning return to television yes. in, um, in 2019, after, well, I think, 25 years away from the small screen, yeah. Yeah. Um, when you played a woman with dementia in Elizabeth is Missing. What was the biggest challenge for you for that role? Because the character that I play in Elizabeth is Missing, as you say, she's suffering from de dementia, but she's not totally in dementia. I happened to see it on the telly the other day. She sat at a bus stop and her daughter is with her and she's in her Hello. dementia state. Hello, are you waiting for the bus? I don't know when it's going to come, nothing ever comes. I hope it won't be too long. <laughs> and doesn't recognise her daughter. And then as she's trying to console this girl that she doesn't know... Oh... Is it man trouble? Well, don't you worry, he'll be back. Pretty girl like you. <laughs> she suddenly realises that it's her daughter, and that, of course, is a terrible, shocking thing. Helen. Helen, I didn't know you. I didn't know my own daughter, Helen. Helen, Helen. It's all right. <laughs> and it was that, it was trying to keep those energies and those levels believable that was most difficult. You're now in your 80s. Yeah. Any plans to retire or do you keep on going now? Oh, no, I mean, if somebody sends me a script that I like and, you know, yeah, I'd love to do something, yeah. Are the scripts at home on the kitchen table that you're going through? <laughs> well, one or two. <laughs> one of those scripts on the kitchen table turned out to be the 2023 the Great Escaper. Glenda starred alongside Michael Caine in a story about a World War II veteran who absconds from his care home and heads to France for a ceremony marking the 70th anniversary of the D-Day landings. 
It was to be Glenda's final film. Sadly, she died at 87, just weeks before it was released. The reviews called her last performance remarkably fitting, dignified, and a wonderful last hurrah. Underlying how the years and her time away hadn't dimmed her incredible power. Glenda once said, Glenda once said of acting, the more you do, the more you realise how painful it is to be lousy and how very difficult it is to be good. And as we've seen, Glenda Jackson really took an easy route, delighted at times in being difficult, but she was always beyond good.